Yeah. And um, so I remember like, you know, writing little stories and entering writing competitions when I was in, you know, middle school mm -hmm. and high school. And it was just always really a part of my life. And I, you know, I say a lot that I'm very lucky that this worked out because I have zero other talents, <laughs> truly zero. A lot of kind of to this, like no directional ability, no really nothing to write home about. So I'm very lucky that this worked out. And um, yeah, it's it's just it really is a dream come true. But I think it's it's such a foundational part of who I am mm -hmm. um, that I've been I've been really writing forever. And then I sold my first novel, which was a book called When You Are Mine, a modern retelling of Romeo and Juliet from Rosalind's point of view, Romeo's ex-girlfriend. Mm -hmm. um, when I was, you know, I think that's about 12 years ago now. Mm -hmm. And I've been writing full time ever since One Italian Summer is my seventh book. Great. Yeah. So. It's fun. It's good. Yeah. And how, um, um, so you started out in young adult, right? I did. And then what made the, what made you make the switch? Well, so, okay. I sold my first book and I was quite young. I was maybe 24, 25 and I was going through my first heartbreak and I just, I was very close. I felt very close. I should say to the teenage experience. Mm -hmm. I felt very close to what it means to be 17, 18, 19. And so it was part of my life experience and what I was going through. And I think that as I've grown and entered my 30s, there are just different things mm -hmm. I want to talk about mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. And with the dinner list, the dinner list, which was my first um, book for adults, very much felt like um, sort of the collection of experience of over, of the, over the course of my mm -hmm. 20s. And yeah, I think in a lot of ways, I really write to figure out how I feel about my own life. Mm -hmm and what it is I'm working through and processing. And so it feels natural now that my books be in this space because it's the space mm -hmm. that I'm in. Mm -hmm. And I hope that that will, that will continue to happen. I hope that my books will continue to reflect my life and my life continue to reflect my books and there be that dialogue as I, as I grow as a person and a writer and all of those things. So yeah, it's, it, it just sort of was a very natural evolution for me and my, and my, my own life, I guess. Well, I read the dinner list and I loved it. You have a, a unique voice and um, it's it's very young and it's um, very today. And I just really, I, I loved the book. It's, Thank you yeah, so much. It was really fast. For anybody that hasn't read it, I, I recommend I'm not it a highly. very long-winded writer. So you can get through my books very quickly. Yeah, they're very... only about 200, 250 pages. And it's like a crawl for me. I started as a short story writer in a lot of ways. So it's like a crawl for me to get to the 200 word line. It's like, it's quite challenging. Um, so, you know, so yes, and I think actually one time maybe my I think the dinner list is maybe the longest book, which is really saying a lot. I feel like it's still under 300 pages. Um, and that novel is was my first um, book for adults. And it's about a woman who shows up to her 30th birthday dinner. And it's that dinner. If you could have dinner with any five people, living or dead, who would they be? So Audrey Hepburn is at the table and her father who passed away when she was very young. And um, and then her ex-boyfriend who she had this decade long relationship with. So yeah, and that was sort of my, also my first foray into writing that thrill. Yeah, yeah, because that seems to be a theme. She, she does this, if you haven't read her, she does this thing with time travel and um, just, you know, little magical things, but then it, it comes back to reality and it's like, wait, did that really happen? Could that have happened? Could she, you know, it, it's, it's very, um, very ingenious the way you do that. That's very kind. Yeah. I think that, you know, the best way to think about magical realism is that it's one magical element that has to exist in the real world and that once we accept that magical element, nothing else changes. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, with the dinner list, it's, it, that woman shows up to her 30th birthday dinner and okay, Audrey Hepburn's there and that's kind of weird, but we just mm -hmm. go with it. Mm -hmm. We accept the rules yeah. of the universe and this is just what's happening. And similarly, my last novel was a book called In Five Years about a woman who gets to live five years in her future, or excuse me, she gets to live an hour, five years in her future, and then she gets there and the hour is nothing like exactly what she thought. And, um, and we just sort of accept that this, mm -hmm. this thing has occurred. Um, and then similarly in One Italian Summer, you know, Katie meets her young mother and, and we just accept that this is what's happening. I think that I find Magical Realism to be really interesting because it's, it's a way to sort of like open up the world. It's a way to have that fantasy and to kind of like get at even just metaphorically something in like a bigger way than you can with just the, you know, the modern tangible mm -hmm. rules of our world. And I also like to write a little bit of wish fulfillment, things that I think about in my in my head, things that I'm just interested in exploring, things that, like you said, what if that I wonder. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, because that's that's always the basis of how my books get started. Is it's like I have two what if situations and they collide. What is it for you? Where do you get your inspiration? So I usually, well, okay, so I'll tell you the story of how One Italian Summer came to be, which is that um, in the summer of 2019, I took a trip with my mom, and um, my mom had always talked about Rome uh, in Italy, much like Carol, um, this, like, magical summer she spent when she was there when she was 20, and she fell in love with this guy named Grimo, and my mother is very happily married to my father, I should say, <laughs> before I continue on with this conversation, Um but we ended up, we ended up finding Ramo, this guy who she had fallen in love with that summer. We found his sister on Facebook and he, she connected us with him and they met at the Trevi Fountain, which is the place that they had met 50 years beforehand. And he brought her this love charm that she had given him 50 years ago. And he was like, I never, you know, loved anyone else. My mom was like, mm. um, I <laughs> um, but, but anyway, it really, that particular instance really got me thinking about just the people that our mothers are before we ever come onto the scene and what it would be like if we got to spend time with them and got to know them. And so, and then, so I will, and then I, I will say, like, I went on to Positano after Rome. I spent a week there. I had really no intention of necessarily writing this story or writing a story that, that was set there. But I will say on my last day in Positano, I just walked around all of the streets and took photos of street signs mm -hmm. and videos, which is always a surefire way that I'm trying to understand the geography because my brain is saying, like, at some point you may want to return mm -hmm. here. Um, so I sort of had, I had that, like, see that idea of like, okay, what if you could spend what if you could spend time with your mother and uh, like, and you were contemporaries? Mm -hmm. And then I will sort of turn on an idea and turn on an idea for about like eight to 10 months. And then I will figure out like the, um, like the why of the book. Like, mm -hmm. what is this book really capital A about? Like, what am I actually trying to say? Okay, it's a story and it has an interesting plot, but like, what do I want you to feel? Mm -hmm. What am I trying to communicate to you? Like, why? What's mm -hmm. the point of this? Mm -hmm. And once I figure that out, then I start writing and I, draft books very quickly I tend to write a book in about three months and I'll just mm -hmm. sort of like go into my little mm -hmm. hole and I'll write 2,000 words a day for about six days a week until until it's complete um I like to like stay in step with a book mm -hmm. I find that it's much more helpful than coming sort of in and out yeah. of it I know you know I have plenty of friends who draft over a period of a few years mm -hmm. who like to just like slowly lay down the bricks but for me I'm like it's kind of a fever pitch like it's mm -hmm. there yeah. and I have to get it yeah. before it disappears because yeah. the idea is gonna get a sort of like yeah. you know depart and and go off yeah. what is your writing process like um it has gotten slower and slower the more the older I've gotten and the more I've written it's almost like the more you know, the more ways you see the story could go. And so you have, there's like choices. Mm -hmm. And now I eliminate, you know, I get confused on the choices. How do I make decisions? Are you somebody who plots? Are you somebody who sort of like lets the story guide where you're going to go? I do both. What I used to. I used to write the first three chapters and the synopsis at the same time. Mm -hmm. I would be figuring out where the, where the story was, what the plot was going to be as I was getting to know the characters and the initial situation, you know, the something has to happen. It has to be a that's day true. that's different. Something does have to happen. Yeah. Much to my chagrin. Yeah. Half the time so I'm like, it's fine. It's just a character study. We're just talking about this girl. Yes. So yeah, and I want to give all the backstory because you know I have I have reams of information about the characters, what they lived through before the book begins, but it's not pertinent to the story. Yeah. And um, so you know, I have to work through all that I'm, I'm struggling with that right now I'm trying to condense really what should be two books into one right now so oh that's interesting <laughs> I've never attempted to do that that's well great. I don't, don't know that I want to but I can't <laughs> seem to not do it sure so. I, I, I hear that I, def I definitely understand that yeah. yeah I have found that for me and again like a, most people are not this way but for me if a first draft doesn't feel like it's sort of there I don't know if it's just because I'm a terrible editor. I'm really not sure, but I, I usually can't get it there. Like the seed has to be there yeah. in the first draft and it has to feel like it's like, okay, I understand what this thing is and now I can kind of make it branch and make it grow and make it live. Mm -hmm. But if that's not true, then um, I will, I have a book in between every book that's published that's on my desktop that um, hasn't been. <laughs> well, you know, that's reassuring actually, because yeah. I did, I have a, a, over 200 pages of this one book and it just, it didn't go anywhere. I mean, I just couldn't end it. And then I'm thinking, well, but I'm framing this wrong. Parts of the story are really good. Yes. But I just don't have it in the right frame. And um, that's part of what I'm trying to mesh with this yeah, other yeah, book. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's like the backstory for this woman, but it's like, wait, 
I'm kind of like the most interesting stuff happens off scene. That's not right. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I think I, I need know. to simplify your background and just let that baby go. Likely. <laughs> Likely. So um, you said that you talked about how you have to know what's what the story is about with a capital A. And I yeah. like that, the theme of it. What, sure. what is the theme of uh, One Time in Summer? I think that for me, um, I really, I, I sort of believe that all writers are really in, interested in exploring like one or two themes over and over and over again. Jane Ann Krantz told me the same yeah. thing. Yeah. yeah. And I yeah. think it's often, you know, not often, I think it probably yeah. always are, is the theme that we are wrestling with in our own life. Like what we're trying to sort out and what is was compelling and of interest to us. And so for me, it's really about the dialogue between fate and free will. How much is in our control and how much is going to happen regardless of what mm -hmm. we do and the choices and decisions that we make. And like, what's the relationship between those two things? I think I I'm often thinking about this in my life, like how much responsibility do I actually have and mm -hmm. how much is life just going to turn out how it turns out. So, um, you know, my last book in five years, I think, was very much about a woman who felt like she had full and total agency over her own life. And her journey over the course of in five years, Danny's was really about um, like letting go and understanding that that life is going to happen. And a lot of times it's not it's it's not what happens but how we choose to react to what happens that like that's actually where we have agency and control right and then i think in um katie's journey in one italian summer is in a lot of ways the opposite she's somebody who we meet and she really doesn't believe that she has much agency over her own life she has just lost her mother and she believes that her mother was the person who sort of made all of her decisions mm -hmm. for her and that her life is a product in fact of the choices that her mother made that she didn't make mm -hmm. and her journey is one to understand that like she has um like she has control over her own life and that like she is you know i i i've um i've been thinking about this a lot as i've you know been been touring this week and been talking a lot about this book that um i think one of the lessons of the novel or one of the things that i would like to that i want to say because it's something that i really had to learn uh because i am so deeply close with my mom is that you know, I think no one has the blueprint for our life or no mm -hmm. one knows the blueprint for our life better than we do, not mm -hmm. even our own mothers. Mm -hmm. And I think for those of us who are very close with our mothers, we can sort of believe sometimes that they know better than we do. Mm -hmm. And I think part of the process of growing up is understanding that um, that, in fact, we do, in fact, know better for mm -hmm. our lives. And there's there's like there's real um, there's power in that. And there's also some sadness because mm -hmm. because in accepting that, it means that we're we're fully grown or yeah. adults. Yeah. And it works the other way too, you know, as, as a mother yeah. of, a, of um, daughters about your age, I, I you know, um, I do know that they know what's best for their life more than I don't have a clue. You know, I have a daughter who's a hydrogeologist who is going to take two months leave from her job to go to Bangladesh to help drill water wells. And I'm like, Bangladesh, and this, she's going during, um, monsoon season now mind you she was in nepal when they had the terrible earthquake oh, she my was goodness. in Colima, um mexico when they had the volcano blow up she yeah. has a history of not <laughs> going she's an adventure chaser you know, we, yeah. well the adventures seem to follow yeah her, okay, you yeah. know i mean so i'm like ah but i did nothing but support her and wonderful and you know because she's got such a loving yeah. giving heart you know and i'm i'm just delighted that I had the opportunity to be a part of, you know, creating this person. So that's so beautiful. Yeah, so that's, you know, just kind of how, it, but it does go both ways. I think ways. it's so true. Yeah. It goes both yeah. ways. Like both yeah. people have to sort of let go and yeah. understand that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I would journey. never want to stop either of my daughters from um, fulfilling their dreams. Yeah. I would never want to be an obstacle to that because what do I know? <laughs> I sit around and make up people in my pajamas. <laughs> <laughs> true, true. That's what we do. It's a nice way to spend the life though. It really is. Yeah, it's yeah. a nice way to spend life. Yeah. 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 yeah that's so nice. Well, are you working on something else now? Or? I am. So I will say that my books tend to focus on like, um, uh, you know, all my books have romance in them as well, mm -hmm. but they tend to not have romance be the central relationship. Mm -hmm. In five years was a love story between two best friends. One Italian summer is a love story between a mother and a daughter. And my next book actually brings romance to the forefront. It is it it it, it is about romantic relationships and 
Um, so I'm working on that right now. And after, obviously, you know, uh, my life has been taken up mostly with publishing one Italian mm -hmm. summer and ch chatting about it and, and all of that over the last few weeks. And now I'll go home and get to dig into some edits on that and make that what it needs to be. And there are some film and TV projects that I'm working on as well. But um, but yeah, it's just, it's been really honestly such a pleasure to be able to be back in bookstores mm -hmm. and be able to meet people face to face and talk to people. And um, and I'm just, I'm hoping this is something that, that can continue. One Italian Summer is really a book about um, it's a book about like pleasure and it's a book about coming back to life in a lot of ways. You know, it's, it's a book about this woman who we meet in this place of really deep grief and we bring her to this place of just, um, she becomes more whole, she becomes more alive. And I, in some way feel and hope that that's like what we're all beginning to do is mm -hmm. come back to life a little bit and gather together and, and so um here yeah <laughs> in the bookstore yeah I, I like wrote a little letter for this book um uh like a few months ago and in it I said like I really just want this to be like tossed in beach bags and like mm -hmm. waterlogged with cocktails and read by pools and read together and so um that my hope is that it will be it'll be a fun a fun summer and that she'll get to tag along for a few of your adventures <laughs> yeah um should we do some questions yeah sure yeah yeah does absolutely. anybody have any questions no. I got one. Oh yeah. I, I want to know about your screenwriting and oh, producing sure. and, and all of that. So I had a I had a young adult book series called Famous in Love. Mm -hmm. And it was about a girl who got plucked from obscurity to star in the next major feature film franchise based on a best selling book series. So it was sort of like Billy Twilight in a yeah. way. She like falls in love with her co-star and, and all this stuff. And I, you know, grew up on WBTV and, mm -hmm. and, and felt like it would make a really fun TV show. And so I was very lucky and I wrote the pilot and it got uh, bought by Warner Brothers. And then we made two seasons of this show. I think, I think it's on Hulu. I like don't know. It's on Hulu or Apple or one of those things now. We only made two seasons, um, and this was back in 2017. But um, but it was it was it was a fun, crazy adventure. It was definitely the hardest thing that I've ever done because, as you so well know, writing books is so like intimate. It's just me, mm -hmm. and then I give it to my mm -hmm. editor, and you know. But ultimately, every word that ends up in that book is a word that I want to be there. And when you create television, it's such a collaborative environment. There's just yeah. hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people involved in making this thing uh, what it needs to be. And I had a really self-admittedly had a very challenging time with that. I was like, but it's mine. And I don't, you know, and you're in a room with eight other people who are like, I don't know what his backstory is. And I'm like, I do. And they're like, that's different. So, um, but I will say that I wrote, I, we did Famous in Love. We did the pilot and then we did season one right before I wrote the dinner list. And the majority, well, at least half of the dinner list, six people talking around mm -hmm. a dinner table. And so it relies, that book especially relies very heavily on dialogue and like the differentiation of dialogue, being able to tell different voices. And I don't know if I necessarily would have been able to write it without, mm -hmm. without that foray into screenwriting because so much of screenwriting is, is just is dialogue. Oh. It's really all, you know, in a lot of ways, it's all you have. Mm -hmm. So I find them to be complimentary, although very, very different worlds. I would say that novel writing to me is like my heart and it's mm -hmm. where like I love and it's where my voice belongs and um and it really feels like writing I think I always say that screenwriting feels like writing adjacent mm. it's like writing <laughs> but sort of math in a way it's, yeah. it's odd it's it's just it's a bit different yeah. but um but I'm lucky that I get to do both yeah oh, cool yeah does somebody have a, a real question anybody else <laughs> mine was we a, won't bite I promise <laughs> Are any of your characters based off of real life people? Um, so I feel like all of my characters in a way are probably like little factions of me, to be honest. I think especially, I would say I'm probably closest you could probably answer this question better than I could. Mm -hmm. I think I'm probably closest to Sabrina and the dinner list. And then um, and then I have like, there are elements of me that are, they're very Danny from in five years. And then my relationship with my mom is, um, really close to a lot of what Katie has with with her mother Carol for sure, um, and I think that no character is ever necessarily like fully based off of a person in my life, but oftentimes the relationship between two characters is based off a relationship. So I would say that for Katie and Carol with my mom and I, and then different friendships in in different books of mine or romantic relationships for that matter. But it's not really necessarily a character; it's more of a relationship. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Oh. 
I cry when I read The Generalist and in five years, and I think to myself, like, do you cry when you're writing this? Because I cry when I'm reading it. <laughs> I, I, I did. I did when I wrote, um, I did when I wrote in five years, and I won't spoil that if anyone hasn't read it, but I, um, I, I sort of, I actually, I'll, I'll tell the story because I remember calling Lila, who's a dear friend of mine and has been my writing buddy for a very long time now, 12 years. Um, and I, I sort of, I figured out what I thought the, the big turns of the plot would have to be. And I called her and I was like, I feel scared. Like I, I don't like this is there's gonna be a lot of pain in this and I'm sort of afraid to write it and I'm afraid on what she'll have to go through and Lila said just stay close to her, which was mm -hmm. such like such beautiful mm -hmm. advice and it's something that I think about all the time and I it, it's really so touching and that is what I try to do with my characters mm -hmm. so to answer your question, because I try to stay so close to them and I write in first person, mm -hmm. I do a lot of times feel the emotion of those scenes so yes I, I remember in writing at uh, in writing in five years especially, I found that very emotional. And, and then a lot of the one a time summer stuff as well, because it is so personal. So yes. Yes. Do you ever experience writer's block like while writing a book, but also like before going diving into something and then you just kind of like you find that inspiration to write a book? Yes. I think that a lot of times it's hard to sort of like get into it. You can make a lot of excuses for starting, right? Like we all know that feeling of a blank page of being like, I don't like, I don't know, I want to get in. But I find my biggest hack has just been like laying down a word count and sticking to it and having absolutely no exceptions. So that is really helpful to me because a lot of times it'll feel like writer's block and I'll feel like I didn't get anything done today that's of value. But if I write, if there are 2000 words that get laid down, something in there is going to be really useful sensitive. and then I can come back the next day and there's something that's been laid down that I have that, that I can work with. So I think just consistency while I'm writing has been really important. I don't write every day because there are a lot of the months of the year I don't write at all. Um, but I would say while I'm writing, consistency is really important in, in trying to ward that off. That's kind of a base. Yeah. Yeah. They really wake up in the middle of the night. And just like, yes. <laughs> I sometimes I will wake up and then I sometimes get lazy and I don't write it and then in the morning I'll be like I really had a great idea but I don't know what it was now. Yes, this happens. This happens. I've had the writer's block mm -hmm. thing that you're talking about, but usually at the beginning I don't know you know exactly where it's going and I'm not sure how it'll start and then walks help and also doing repetitive things like weeding or vacuuming and a character will say something i'll hear something yeah. uh, i don't know what he ever saw in me it's the first mm -hmm. line of the french war bride mm -hmm. that I it's two old women who loved the same man oh. <laughs> <laughs> you know and it's like oh okay yeah okay i'll set this book up two old women talking because i had this whole story of this character but how and the only way she would tell how she stole him or whatever she just woman <laughs> thought was if she told it her way all the way through and then she would give the other woman a chance to tell her about her relationship with him. So, so that was, it was just kind of born by that, you know, and that some books come like a gift. Mm -hmm. Some books are so mm -hmm. easy to write. It's like, you know, it's like, I don't know. I, I have this. I have this odd theory that there are all these book ideas hovering up here. God creates clouds of books and books <laughs> ideas. And if you're open and receptive, one will come down to you. Yeah. And um, if you're not willing to take it and go with it, he'll give it to somebody totally. else. Totally. <laughs> <laughs> talks about this in that book, Big Magic. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, and it's so true. It's yeah. absolutely true. And oftentimes like it will happen. Come down. You'll yeah. have like a like maybe a few chapters or half of a book or whatever of mm -hmm. something that you've started, and then you'll hear about a book being published that's almost identical. Yeah. Well, the the same idea same just finds someone else. Yeah, yeah, like in sure. science, you know, it's crazy how yeah. two people were working on electricity exactly the same yeah. time in history. It's know? so interesting. I mean, all these things. I, I just don't believe in coincidence yeah. anymore. Yeah, <laughs> I love that. I love that. Yes, Lila. So mm, without spoiling anything, mm -hmm. um, uh, I would say all three of your adult novels um, have like a like a a reveal that happens let's say maybe like half or two-thirds of the way through the book so like in the dinner list we get halfway two-thirds of the way through yeah. we learn something about somebody at the table um and then in 
um, in one Italian summer, which I've had the pleasure of reading already, we get again maybe two thirds of the way through, even three quarters of the way through, and we learn something about Carol that we haven't yeah. known previously. At what point in your writing process do you figure out what that like two thirds? I'm, I don't know if it's like the act two break or what, yeah, like, yeah. At what point like you figure out like, what that twist is. Yeah, yeah, that's such a great question. Um, <laughs> thanks, that. I didn't take you here, I promise. Um, I so that like I, earlier I was talking about the why of the book and the, like what what it's sort of capitally about and that is what I see the twist as being so I'll have an idea a, like a conceit for a book of what if you could live an hour in your future what if you could meet your mom and you were contemporaries what if you showed up to that you know that birthday dinner and then the twist is the sort of why like why it's important why this story and it will usually come again like about six to ten months after I've had that initial conceit idea mm -hmm. and at the point that the twist comes then it's time to start writing because mm -hmm. now I understand and it's really a lot of times the only thing I will know I'll know the concept and then I'll know sort of what that midway thing is going to be mm -hmm. but that thing is the is the thing that gives like the book meaning and gives the book life so you don't really start writing until you know I don't start writing until I know what that is going to be yeah okay. yeah okay. and that's like that usually when I have when I when that comes is when I understand what I need like what I need to write what the book is going to be yeah yeah I don't know if it will always be that way I feel like I'm running out of twists and turns but <laughs> <laughs> we'll see we'll see yeah, each story will present it yeah, yeah yeah exactly yeah you'll get your cloud yeah <laughs> <laughs> one more question I have a question yeah so for both of y'all both of your books kind of deal your most recent at least kind of deal with some really kind of heavy stuff mm -hmm. like you have grief in yours and you're dealing with like IVF and some of the struggles that go along with that but they managed to still really be uplifting like not that there wasn't any crying I cried a little but like overall they felt very like warm and like a, just nice and happy and like happy First of all, is that intentional? Like, are you trying to deal with heavy stuff, but in a way that isn't? And also, like, how do you do that? <laughs> how do you manage that balance? Susan Elizabeth Phillips always says life is too short for unhappy endings. I you know, like there's, that. You know, there's like too much bad stuff out there on the news to pick up a book and read something that's going to, you know, leave you with a downcast spirit. And um, I don't know. I, I, I want my books to be uplifting because that's the experience I want as a reader. You know, that's why I read. I love to get immersed in a story and then it ends with that satisfying, oh, that's just right, you know. And um, I want to give that to readers. Yeah. So it's deliberate on my part. I think that, you know, like I write a lot of times to sort of probe the edges of what it is that I'm afraid of. And what I'm like, I think my really my biggest fear is losing my mother, even though, you know, if we're both lucky that mm -hmm. inevitably will yeah. happen at some point, I will have to be here without her. And, and so and I also see grief and love is just like really intimately tied. Mm -hmm. uh, I was watching this interview with Andrew Garfield, actually, and he said grief is just unexpressed love. Mm -hmm. It's love that has no place to go. And I thought that was really so beautiful. <laughs> it's really, it's just so very human. And I like to write books that, that are, that are human, that are just dealing in the, the, the real, like just the emotion of what we all have to go through, you part of what it means to be here. You can't have that grief without the love. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. That's right. Yeah. Well put. <laughs> well put. Any other questions? Are there authors that inspire each of you, or do you prefer to read a variety? Oh, yeah, there are a lot of uh, authors that do inspire me. Oh, that's yeah. so cool. Yeah, I love the dinner list, and I, I you know, when I discover an, um, an author, I often will go on binges. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a fun thing to do. Yeah, uh, right now I'm um, reading Beatrice Williams, um, a, a friend of mine, Erica Spindler. Mm -hmm. so we were talking on the phone the other day. She writes um, thrillers, and she's oh, a friend, yeah. and she's done events here. Um, she turned me on to Beatrice Williams, and I just love her voice. And she does historic. She said she writes things kind of like you do, you know. <laughs> so if you read her, I said no, you know, and, and maybe that's why I like her because she goes to topics, you know, like historical fiction. But um, she has a very she has your um, banter 
you know, mm. like your modern day banter she does like in the 60s or whatever. I love that. Yeah. I'll so, check that out. Yeah. So huh. I um I am like, I mean, I'm lucky enough to have a lot of author friends in my life, mm -hmm. which is wonderful. Mm -hmm. You inspire me. My friend Lila Sales, the wonderful novelist. Um, my friend John Smith has a book out, actually also came out on Tuesday. It's called The Unsinkable Greta James. It's wonderful. Mm -hmm. I loved it very much. So I'm yeah, I feel like I'm I'm very lucky to have a lot of women writers in my mm -hmm. life and and I, I get to read early drafts of their mm -hmm. of their work and their books i just finished um my dear friend gabrielle zevin's new book called tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow that's just brilliant and beautiful so um yes inspired by the work and the women both yeah great question yeah how do you know whenever a book is really ready to end and whenever you know that the ending is just right for you to cut it off and just let that book be? Like, you know that it's your finished masterpiece. Like, when do you know when that time is come? Oh, masterpiece is a big word. But <laughs> I, um, I, it's really, it's like, it's a feeling. And I'm never mm. sure exactly how a book's going to end. I will say I'm a fan, um, I'm a fan of, happy endings but not finished endings mm -hmm. my yeah. books tend to always yeah. end with like a lot of open air and mm -hmm. and you know i'm like i think that i always want a book to end and for you to be able to to think about what you think happened next mm -hmm. and i really mm -hmm. truly believe that once a book is published it belongs to you as much as it belongs to me like it's no longer for me to say what mm -hmm. happens after mm -hmm. come to you, babe. yes yeah. yeah and i so it's just it's it's some kind of just feeling of completion that i will come to and recognize and i never know exactly when it's going to come i'll have an idea of sort of what I, what emotional state i want to get her to mm -hmm. um but not necessarily exactly where the plot is going to end. It's just, mm -hmm. it just, yeah, mm -hmm. it's just a feeling. And then mm -hmm. I, I know when I found it. Yeah. 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 Thank you guys so much. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah. This is so lovely. Thank you so much for being here. Thank yeah. you so much for being so here. Great to well. meet you. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Here's some more, way more uh, in person book events. Yeah. Yeah. Also personalizing books if you would like they're all signed all the one at a time some are um copies but if you would like me to write anything personally I'm happy to do that as well. Thank you. Thank you. All right, virtual attendees, we're just going to cut this off now. Thank you all for joining us. Uh -huh. Bye, Rebecca Small. <laughs> <laughs>